Greetings to all listeners and viewers in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is Paul Sandhu. Today I want to begin a topic, and I believe this will turn into uh, a somewhat of a series because it's a very complex yet important topic, which is, uh, as the title suggests, uh, based on Genesis 3, 5, where the serpent said to Eve, one of the things he said to her was, ye shall be as gods. And generally speaking, it is taught that this is a false statement. And I want to look at what the Bible teaches and see if it is false or not. And if it is not, what does it really mean? And secondly, I want to give a teaching which is related to this on Genesis 1.27, that God created man in, the, in his own image. In the image of God created he him, we are told, male and female created he them. And I want to dig deep into that as to what the word image means, first of all. And secondly, who is it being spoken of here? Is that referring to Adam or there's somebody else that is being referred to in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27? So I'm going to begin with a short clip from a video about this teaching on Genesis 3, 5, which is the common teaching. Apparently, every preacher I've ever heard when they mention this teaching in Genesis 3, 5 and they talk about the serpent devil, they always say that this was a lie that was told to Eve that ye shall be as gods. But boy, the devil doesn't like this idea that God created the earth. The devil came to Eve in the Garden of Eden. The first thing he said to the woman, he said, Eve, hath God said? Yea, hath God said? He's, tr he's, he's trying to raise doubts about God's Word. Satan always tries to raise doubts about God's Word. That's one of the reasons we've got all this confusion on the different Bible versions. You know, where is God's Word? Is it over here? I don't know where it is. We cover more on that in video 7. The second thing he said to the woman, he said, ye shall not surely die. He's calling God a liar, basically. The third thing he said to Eve is what I want to talk to you about tonight. He said, Eve, if you eat off that tree, ye shall be as gods. And right there is where the whole idea of evolution got started. It didn't start with Charlie Darwin. <laughs> it started with Satan in the Garden of Eden. He wants you to think you can become a god. Yes, boys and girls, we started like an amoeba, and we're evolving. We're getting bigger and better and stronger and smarter, and someday we're going to sail around the universe and discover new life forms like Star Trek. I included that short clip there because uh, it is the common teaching among the so-called uh, Christian televangelists and uh, mainstream uh, Christian teachers that Genesis 3, 5, this phrase, ye shall be as gods, as Satan said to Eve, was a lie. So what I'm going to do is, first of all, I'm going to look at this whole verse, uh, Genesis chapter 1, uh, verses uh, 1 through 5, and then we shall see what it is that uh, the serpent actually said to Eve, and we shall see if all of it was a lie, or if only some of it was a lie and some of it was true. One thing we should keep in mind is that the devil, you know, being subtle, he doesn't, everything he sees, he, he does not Everything he's going to tell you is not going to be 100% lie. He is going to mix it in with a great deal of truth. You know, there could be 80, 90% truth, but that's that little 10% is enough to eventually turn that whole thing into a lie and being subtle and being clever. He understands that, and that's how he spreads his lies is by mixing them in with the truth. So let's turn to Genesis chapter 3 and see what in it was the truth and what was the lie. Let's start reading uh, from Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 through verse 5. And in verse 1 we read, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. So let's keep in mind that the Lord God made the serpent and he put him there in the garden. He just didn't make his way there of his own accord. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And this is a clever way of, you know, uh, getting the person involved is uh, by asking them a question to which you already know the answer, but it is to for a, a purpose that uh, the person being questioned may not first be aware of. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. And again in this verse 3 here, first of all, we know that God gave this commandment to Adam only. He did not give it to Eve, okay? So it was, it was Adam who conveyed God's words to Eve, and then I suppose he added to it, because God never said that they couldn't touch it. At least that's not what we read in Genesis chapter 2. So I guess that may have been Adam that, uh, you know, added this little little uh, caveat to this command that they shouldn't even touch this tree when he talked to Eve about it. And the serpent said unto the woman, now let's look at the words of the serpent, okay? 
you shall see that there are three different things that the serpent told the woman. You can divide the last part of it into two parts. So you can say there are four things, but they are actually three. Okay, and I've highlighted them in different colors on the screen so you can see which, which ones I'm referring to. First thing he said to the woman, the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. So that's the first thing he told her. And then verse 5, for God does know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So he told her, first of all, that you shall not die. And secondly, he told her, your eyes shall be opened. And thirdly, he told her, you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And you know what the problem is when people refer to this part of this verse 5, this last two clauses in it, which is, uh, ye shall be as gods, comma, knowing good and evil, they do not understand that the last, pardon me, the last clause in it actually begins with and, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. This is one clause, this is one thought, this is one idea, so the complete idea here, the third thing that he said to the woman was, you shall be as gods, comma, knowing good and evil. What he's saying is you shall be gods, and what I mean by that is that you shall come to understand good and evil. That's, he explained to the woman what he meant by them becoming as gods. And that last part here, those last four words in it, knowing good and evil is generally, and I should say not even generally, is almost always left out by these preachers, just like Kent Hovind, he did not talk about this part saying knowing good and evil, that this is also something that the serpent said. So we should qualify it that when we talk about ye shall be gods, we ought to qualify it that what the serpent meant was that they would come to an understanding of good and evil. He did not tell her that, you know, you are going to go and sit on the throne of God and you're going to start ruling the universe. That is not what the serpent said. Okay, so when we carefully and simply parse the words written on the page, okay, then the meaning becomes somewhat different than when people teach by reading into the Bible rather than reading the words of the Bible. And the second thing, now let's see, so there are three things he told her. Number one, you shall not die. Was that a lie? Well, of course it was a lie. We can, we all know that. Eve died, everyone dies. So yes, that was surely a lie when he told her. But then the second thing he told her, for God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. Now let's see if this part of the second thing that he told Eve, was this the truth or was it a lie? So let's take a quick read through Genesis chapters 3, verses 6 and 7. And when the woman saw that the, food, that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. Okay. So, in verse 7, what do we read? And the eyes of them both were opened. And what is it that uh, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, verse 5, the serpent told the woman? For God does know that in the, in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. And in verse 7, what does the Bible tell us? The eyes of them both were opened. So the second thing that the serpent told Eve, which was that the eyes, their eyes will be opened, was actually not a lie. It was the truth. There is something also very, very important to understand here when it talks about the eyes being opened. So which eyes is it being referred to here? Or is it talking about their physical eyes? Well, let's look at verse 6. And when the woman saw, so obviously the woman could see, she was not blind, that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes. So she had eyes, okay, eyes that could see, and therefore she was not blind. She was perfectly fine in her vision as far as the natural physical state is concerned. So when in verse 7 we read that the eyes of them both were opened, which eyes is it talking about here? It is speaking about their spiritual eyes. Okay, it is impossible to be spiritual without the knowledge of good and evil. So therefore, you know, people that teach you that before they ate the fruit, they were highly evolved and they were highly spiritual and they were tuned with God and they were this and they were that. They, you know, basically they elevate them to the status of Godhood. They don't know what they're talking about because what they lacked before they ate that fruit 
for something we call a conscience, okay? What is a conscience? A conscience is the faculty which by which we distinguish between good and evil. So if they had no knowledge of good and evil, neither did they have a conscience. And without a conscience, you cannot be spiritual. I will get into, as we get deeper into this teaching, you know, you will begin to understand what the Bible calls spirituality as opposed to, you know, what uh, the New Agers or uh, the mystics like yogis, etc., might call spirituality. They're quite different. Biblical spirituality is directly related to the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, that tree that was planted there, it was not there by accident, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And also the tree of life was right next to it. Again, the relationship of the knowledge of evil and good to life, or of good and evil to life, is something that we will explore in this series. Because if you recall, if you read in the book of Revelation, Genesis and Revelation are bookends of the Bible. In that end of book, what do you read here? What's in that new heaven that comes down from God? There is the tree of life, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is no longer there because it is not needed anymore. But it certainly was needed at that time in the Garden of Eden in Genesis or it would not have been there. So here, so the three things that the serpent told Eve, ye shall not surely die, one was a lie. The second one, that your eyes shall be opened, was actually the truth. Now let's look at the third thing that he told her, which is, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Let's see if that was the truth or was that a lie. So let's move down a few verses to verse 22 of the same chapter of Genesis chapter 3. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now lest he put his forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So 22, and the Lord God said, now who's talking here? This is the Lord God himself. The Lord God said, behold, the man is become as one of us. What is it that the serpent told Eve in Genesis chapter 3 verse 5? Then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And in verse 22, the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil. So did the Lord God himself confirm the words of the serpent? Did he agree with the serpent or did he disagree? Did he say that the serpent lied to Eve when he told her that you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil? Or did the Lord God himself said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil? Did, like the serpent, did the Lord God confirm that to become as one of us, meaning as become as God or as gods, the requirement is to know good and evil, to have knowledge of good and evil. They both qualified it. The serpent himself, when he said that in verse 5, he said, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil, he qualified his statement. He explained that what he meant was that in order for them to be as gods, what would happen is that they would have acquired the knowledge of good and evil, which will make them as gods. And the Lord God said the same thing, that the man has become as one of us. What did he say, become one of us because he's got superpowers? Or that he can suddenly now hold the sun in his hand and hold it up in the sky? Or that he can fly like Superman or something like that? No, he said no such thing. All he said was, that man has become one of us to know good and evil. So the qualification to be as God or as gods, like the serpent put it, is to understand and have the knowledge of good and evil. That's it, period. Nowhere did either one of them say that, you know, this meant that, you know, suddenly they're going to become like God, you know, they're going to start ruling the universe or something like that. No, no such thing. All they said was, that man has acquired the knowledge of good and evil, which belonged to the gods only. And what makes a god, God the creator, is of course God the creator. But what makes any of God's creatures to be known as gods? It is that they have the knowledge of good and evil, that they have a conscience. That's what makes them gods. That's it, period. Now the conscience can either be good or it can be evil. That is a different story. But anyone with a conscience in the Bible 
qualifies to be a god. That's why in Psalm 82, we are told Jesus himself said, you know, that it's written in the scriptures that ye are gods, yet you shall die like men. Okay? So, the knowledge of good and evil, having a conscience, acquiring a conscience, elevates or at least separates a person or a creature from being what? Like a mere robotic creature. This is the difference between consciousness and conscience. It is conscience that makes you more than a robot. A robot can be conscious, it can be doing things, it can have understanding, but unless it has a conscience, it'll remain a robot. And that is what Adam and Eve were in a very real sense, that they had consciousness, okay? That they were aware of their surroundings, that they could evaluate information, but not in terms of good and evil. That requires a conscience, and they did not have a conscience. This is why that tree was necessary there. This is why the serpent was necessary there. This is why evil is necessary in God's creation, because it has served the purpose of, first of all, creating creatures that have a conscience like God does. And secondly, as we shall see later on in the study of, of purging that conscience that they first acquired, which was a conscience of evil, and by purging it by the blood of Christ to make it into a pure and absolutely good conscience like that of God himself, which is what make them makes it possible for them to bear the image of God. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the word image and in Genesis 127, but before I do, I just want to again go back to Genesis chapter 3 and verses 4 and 5, the three things that the serpent told Eve, you shall not surely die, your eyes shall be opened, ye shall be as gods, knowing in good and evil. Out of them two were truth, two were true, they were right, they were correct, one was a lie. The lie was that you shall not, you shall not surely die, but the fact that your eyes shall be opened was true, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Knowing good and evil, keep that in mind, knowing good and evil was true. Okay? And like the serpents didn't tell them that, you know, they are going to be the rulers of all creation or something like that. No, neither did God say that. God simply said, you know, they become man's become one of us because he has now acquired a conscience and he understands good and evil. But that didn't make man good. Okay, just having a conscience doesn't make you good. It just means that you can tell the difference between them. Consciences are of two types, evil and good. And we shall see that this was a process this was a process that God set in motion on that day to create a being who, first of all, like him, would have a conscience. And secondly, in the process of time, through all the events that have happened throughout the big, since the beginning of creation, to bring us to a place where that conscience of that creature, which had become evil and contaminated in that garden, could be purged, could be purified, could be made absolutely good so that the creature would then be worthy, would be actually a God type of being. He would be a God kind of being. Like we have mankind, that would be God kind, because God wanted to have children, okay? But his children had to have his own conscience. Otherwise, they could not be his children. They had to be absolutely good, like him. And that is not something that he could do and it was a magic wand. It was a process that needed to be followed. And that's what we are talking about here, friends, is this process. Is this, this will bring you the understanding of why it was necessary for evil to exist in God's creation. It was not just to test man. It was so that man's conscience could be purged and made into an absolutely good conscience. I'm going to introduce another idea here, which I will elaborate on later. And with this, with this teaching, what I intend to do is because time is very, very limited for me right now. I'm going to, you know, do a teaching as far as I can get on any given day or, you know, whenever I have time. And I will keep adding to it. So this is by no means going to be complete today. This is just the introduction, you could say. And I want to introduce this idea that a good conscience like that of God. You remember when Jesus said to that man, why callest thou me good? There is none good save one that is God. What Jesus meant was that there is only one being 
who has an absolutely good conscience in that he is absolutely impossible for him to be evil in any way, shape or form. He is always and he is absolutely and perfectly good at all times. And that person is God. OK, so this is what God required in his children was his image, which is means his consciousness and his conscience had to be imprinted on his offspring. And as far as the conscience is concerned, a good conscience cannot be programmed onto a blank slate. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, before they ate that fruit, were blank slates, okay? But a good conscience cannot be programmed, cannot be written on a blank slate. It can only be overwritten. Pay attention to what I'm saying here. It can only be overwritten on an evil conscience. So it was necessary that their first conscience that they acquired was that of the serpent by listening to him that it was an evil conscience. And in the process of time, God would bring forth the ink that would be necessary to purge that evil out of them and then overwrite it with his good. So that in the end, when that work was finished, they would be absolutely good like him which means they would become absolutely incapable of ever being evil and therefore they would be the only creatures in God's creation who would be worthy to be his heirs. God, angels cannot be God's heirs because he charged the angels with folly. Angels have the capability of doing evil. Man cannot be God's heir. In Corinthians, in the first chapter of Corinthians, uh, in 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, we can read that flesh and blood cannot inherit. It emphatically states that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. If man in his flesh and blood state could be made capable of being good like God, he would have been the heir of God's kingdom. But it is not possible. Therefore, God had to create a new creature. That new creature could not be made from scratch. It had to be done as a process. And it is this process that we are now going through, all of us individually, that we come into this world, we are introduced to evil like Eve was in that garden. We become evil, we do evil things, evil things are done to us. So what we acquire is a knowledge of evil. And it is then that God takes us one here, one there, one in this part of the world, one in this nation, and it begins to work in us. And what's working in us is the blood of Jesus Christ because of our faith in it. That blood alone has the power to remove, to purge evil. You know, the Catholics teach about purgatory and the fire. No, sir, you could be in purgatory for eternity and not an iota inside you will change. It is only the blood of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 9, 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God purge your conscience? from dead works to serve the living God. Okay, this is this Bible is a story of the programming of our conscience, much more than our consciousness, our conscience, to match it, to bring it to be perfect a copy of God's own conscience, which is why we can be formed into the image of God. Now let's talk about Genesis 127, which people teach that Adam was the person that was created right in the beginning in the image of God. And I'm going to dispel that myth as well. In the Bible, till now, there is only one person and one person only who is the image of God, and that person is Jesus Christ. That's it. None of us have the image of God. We are being shaped into it, those of us who believe, but we are not there yet, okay? And we won't be until our redemption is complete, until the second coming. This will not, this work will not be finished. But then, yes, there will be a whole family who will be created, who will have been formed and shaped into the image of God, okay? But at the present time, the only one and the firstborn, the first begotten, who is the image of God is Jesus Christ. So let's turn to Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. Okay, it appears that I will not have the time today to go into the study of the word image and of Genesis chapter 1 and all the other parts of the Bible where the image, the word image is used in regards to primarily Christ Jesus, okay? However, I do want to say something here, which is, I want to conclude with this thought, that life itself, as we read in Genesis chapter 3, that God blocked access for man to the tree of life, 
and that access is restored in the book of Revelation as the story comes to an end. Okay, so does that like, you know, you think that this Bible is just like a man-made story? People don't know the Bible. If they really did, you know, it would be an instant that they would understand that this has to be divine. It has to be you know, inspired of God. Otherwise, no man could write such a story. Anyhow, you know, if you really do want to know God, you can. You have to believe in him. And you know what? Most people will say, well, I don't believe. Okay, fair enough. If you really want to, you can even ask God to give you the faith to believe in him. Okay, ask and it shall be given. Even the faith that I have to believe in him is not something that was generated within myself. It was something that God gave me as a gift. And, and that's how I came to believe in him. That's how anybody comes to believe in him. All right, so if you're going to pray, pray to God, ask him to give you the faith so you can believe. And what you believe in is, is in Romans 10 we read that if you shall confess with your mouth, your sins. No, it doesn't say that, you know. If you go to most churches, that's what they'll tell you. But again, you know, churches are dens of iniquity. They are houses of lies. So that's not where you hear the truth. The Bible says that if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved, okay? And if you do that, if you do believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you are going to, something is going to happen to you, okay? And then this Bible, which is a book, which is a closed book, it'll open up to you and you'll begin to understand it. And that's where it begins, okay? So ask God to give you the faith so that you can believe in Jesus and that these words that I speak to you, you will be able to hear them, the Bible, the King James Bible in the English language. When you read it, it will open up to you and you will understand it. Okay, what I wanted to say about life and the tree of life is this. The life, the word life itself means the absence of death. So life is always eternal, okay? Life is not meant to be coming to an end at any point in time. Life is always meant to be eternal. The state in which we exist today, from the time we are born till the time our body is going to die, this you could say is a gestation period for us. We literally are in the womb to prepare us for the time when life will actually begin. And it is here that we come to the understanding of what life is, who the life giver is, and what we need to do to have this life, which is to have faith in God. That's what you require. All right, so people think that this 50, 60, 70, 80 years is all there is to life. Man, you are sadly mistaken, okay? Like I said, you are literally in the womb at the present time. It's like a fetus saying, you know, that's all, is the nine months in the fetus is all the extent of his life. You know how foolish that is. And this is foolish for us to think that this present time is our time of life. This present time is a time of learning, it is a time of understanding, and the understanding has come. God is a mystery in many ways, but enough of this mystery has been revealed to us that he is no longer a stranger to us. We can understand his existence and the reason for our existence. So if you want to understand it, follow along in this series. I will give you a reason and a logical explanation. Again, whether you believe it or not is entirely up to you, but you will never be able to say that my answers were not without reason. Okay, they were without reason. That would be impossible to say. So keep that in mind. As in the next part of this series, I will you know, start with Genesis 127 and speak about that verse of scripture that God created, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, semicolon, that semicolon there is very important. Male and female created he them. For now, thank you for listening. This is Paul Sandhu. Greetings to all listeners and viewers in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray that everyone that hears this will take the time to study and meditate on these teachings because they are, they are strong meat, I believe, going into the very heart of the purposes of our existence and the purpose of which our Lord God created us and all things in the first place. Last uh, few days ago, I started a series which is titled, and ye shall be as God, said the serpent to Eve, and he was right. Okay, That is based, of course, on Genesis chapter 3, verse 5, where the serpent in the Garden of Eden said to Eve that if they ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, one of the things that will happen to them would be that they shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, at the end of that video, which is linked in the description, and uh, I would recommend for those who have not seen it to watch that first, 
I'm not going to continue the study and I had concluded that uh, part one with the or the introduction to the series with the that I, that I would continue it with the definition or going deeper into the study of the word image in the Bible as it applies to man. For example, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, we read, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, and male and female created he them. Okay, this is probably one of the most misunderstood scriptures in the Bible. And uh, this definition, this, you know, this, if you understand what that word image means and who it applies to, then it will help us to understand what it is that is happening to us as we ourselves are being transformed into something which is the image of Jesus, as we are told in the Bible, and what that exact, what exactly that means. Right now, I want to talk about one word, which is very, very important word in the Bible, and that is the word image. In regards to Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, especially, where we read, So God created man in his own image, comma, in the image of God created he him, semicolon, male and female created he them. Okay, now the confusion in regards to this image of God teaching, it stems from the fact that in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, I'm going to go ahead and tell you what it's about, and then I will prove it as this study progresses. In the image of God created he him, which is a single person. That him that is being referred to here is not Adam. It is Jesus Christ, okay? And I will prove it, like I said to you. And then male and female created he them. So male and female that were created are Adam and Eve. And the difference is this, that Jesus being created in the image of God means that he is an exact duplicate copy of God. He is God in every sense because he has God is the original from which Jesus is the copy or the, the, the facsimile, you could say, who is not just resembles God, but is actually an exact duplicate of God, which is what makes him God. On the other hand, Adam and Eve, they, are made, they were made in the likeness of God. And again, I will show you a scripture where it tells us, particularly in regards to Adam, that he was made in the likeness of God, not in the image of God. And these things, yes, you know, if you don't understand what I'm saying right now, please bear with me. You will understand, but these differences are very, very important to understand. That God's purpose in creation was to bring about a created being who is going to be his exact own duplicate. That is what we do when we have a family, okay? We want to reproduce our own kind, our own species, okay? Man and woman have a child that is also going to be a man or a woman. Okay, not a monkey or a donkey or an elephant or something like that. No, it is going to be uh, of their own kind. And this is when God set about to reproduce himself, the creature that he was going, the creator would bring forth, they would also need to be his own kind. They would need to be his own duplicates in order to be his family. More so than duplicates, you know, they would need to be his own kinds. So God could give birth only to God kind whereas man gives birth to mankind. Just like man gives birth to mankind, God, when he has children, he would give birth to God kind. He would beget God beings. He would beget God children, okay? Not man children or angel children or any other species. They would necessarily need to be God's own kind, okay? And that is what is meant by that word image, that anybody that is created in the image of God is God's kind, right? Jesus is called unequal with God. And why is Jesus both a creature and a creator? This is also a great deal of confusion in regards to this. Jesus was a created being in his body. The body of God in which God came to dwell did not exist till about 2000 years ago. So in that respect, Jesus is a creature, and he's called the beginning of God's creation. You can read that about in the book of Revelation. And that is what is meant by that. But the person that lived inside that body is the eternal God. So as God, he had his existence for eternity from everlasting to everlasting. But as God in the flesh, as God in a body, 
that existence began 2,000 years ago. So yes, so that respect, he is both a creature and a creator. Rather, I should say that he is both a creature and the creator, not a creator. Now, this may be a good place to uh, introduce the reason for which God has created anything at all. The purpose of creation, ultimately, is for God to reproduce himself in bodily form. And the way that is done is that God forms the body, but then he reproduces, or he, yeah, he, he produces the body, but he reproduces himself inside that body. The person that lives inside that body is God. That is the purpose of creation. And this is a purpose that is not meant just for one person. For example, in the body of Jesus Christ, God dwells, the Godhead dwells fully, we are told. So the person that dwells in that body of Jesus Christ that was formed in the womb of Mary is the eternal God, and he dwells in it fully. So he is all God in that body. But Jesus is called the firstborn. So where there is a firstborn, there is going to be a secondborn, and a thirdborn, and a fourthborn, and so on and so forth. The rest of God's family, the rest of his children, he is going to form their bodies. He has formed their bodies which we live in right now. But this is not our permanent body. He is going to form, he has formed the body. And in this present time, what he is doing is he is taking the person that lives inside the body and he is transforming him or her or it into the image of his own person. In the case of Christ Jesus, we are told in Hebrews 1, 3, that he is the express image of God's person. Basically, that the person that is inside the body is an exact duplicate of the living God. And that is the meaning of that word image. So I'm going to explain to you the purpose for which God created us all to begin with and why it was necessary for evil to be present in the world into which we would be born, so that God could use that evil and transform us into his own image. And the meaning of that word image, that is what we have to study to understand what is meant by that. Most people confusedly think that when it refers to image, it is speaking about the body, that it is a person in a body that has two hands, two legs, you know, two eyes, etc. And that is what is meant by the image of God. That is hardly the meaning in the Bible. The meaning is the image. What is the meaning of that word? Let's look at it. And then you will begin to understand how great a purpose it is for which God has created everything, but ultimately the purpose for which he created man, so that the psalmist King David wrote in Psalm 8, what is man that you are mindful of him? God's mind is full of the thoughts of man. Why? Because of uh, what is so special about man. If you look around him, you know, full of, genesis, full of jealousy and envy and hatred and murder and every manner of evil, that is the person that you hardly want to think about. But that is not the person that God is thinking about. What he is thinking about is the person that would come forth out of this creature called man when the transformation of his image was completed. So the whole purpose of creation was to make a race of beings who would be identical to God in their image. And once you understand what image means, then this will begin to make sense to you. This was the goal of creation. This was the purpose of creation. And the very first person that was a created being in the body, that was also God in person, as we can read in High Hebrews chapter 1, who being the express image of his person, okay, that person is Jesus Christ. So the very first person that actually bore the image of God is Jesus Christ. It is not Adam or Eve. But this process would occur through the agency of Adam and Eve and their race. Okay, it is through that race that that first being who bore the exact image of God would arise, that is Jesus Christ would come from this race. So this race 
in the natural would come first. But in the spiritual, Jesus is the beginning of God's creation, meaning that that was the intention or the purpose of creation itself was to make a family for God, to have children who are going to be identical in person to him, who would dwell in bodies, okay, who would have existence in the flesh. That was the reason. And why did God need to do that? That is something I'll go into later on. So this whole thing happened as a process beginning in Genesis chapter 1, where God begins this process of creation of man. And he begins by forming Adam and Eve from the dust of the ground. And then he puts them in the garden where he plants a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then he, of course, puts the serpent or the devil there to tempt Adam and Eve so that they would eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, without which this plan of his could never come to pass of creating a person that would be identical to him in their inner being, in their mind, in their soul, in their heart, in their spirit. Okay? And that person who bore that exact image is Jesus Christ, not Adam. Okay, Please get that through your, really think about this here, that if Adam and Eve had been created in the image of God, that they were identical to God like Jesus Christ is, they would have never have fallen for Satan's lies. But they could not be like God without knowing good and evil. That is the prerogative, that is, sorry, the prerequisite for becoming as God is to have the knowledge of good and evil, without which you can never be like him. This was this is why it was necessary for that tree to be planted, and not only for that tree to be planted there, but for Adam and Eve to eat that fruit, so that their education in the knowledge of good and evil could begin. And it is because they were, they acquired this knowledge and understanding that they became creatures of conscience. I know I'm throwing out a lot of information here, which is going to be new for a lot of people, but nonetheless, it is the truth that a conscience is that faculty which we possess, which is able to distinguish between good and evil. Okay, that is what a conscience is. So without the knowledge of good and evil, Adam and Eve were not creatures of conscience, okay? And without being creatures of conscience, they could never be creatures that would bear the image of God eventually. Okay, so that was the first step. So this here scripture in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, when you read it, look at each word very carefully. Look at the punctuation very carefully. And, you know, this phrase, in the image of God created he him, then it says, comma, colon, male and female created he them. This is speaking about three different people. That him in the first part of that clause, that in, in, the, in the second clause of that sentence, is not Adam, it is Jesus Christ. And now I'm going to show you more evidence, okay, of where in Scripture we read, verse after verse, that talks about Jesus being the image of God, never about Adam, because Adam was not in the image of God. It is in understanding the definition of the word image that this will begin to make sense. And then this whole thing about the garden, about the tree, about ye shall be as gods, and will begin to make sense. We will understand it, that, you know, there is a plan, there is a purpose, there is a reason that whatever has happened, it has been it has happened exactly the way God planned it. It didn't happen by happenstance or randomly or without any reason and God set about to fix things. No, he planned everything to happen the way it has. And then it again proves the omnipotence, the omniscience of God, that he truly is the Almighty, that all things truly were created by him, and they all truly were created for him. And this again will teach you that your understanding, you think of yourself as you, 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 you know, me, me, me. No, your existence, you exist solely for the purposes of God. God is the potter, we are the pots. He has, he has shaped all of us to serve his purposes. And when you begin to understand that, what great a purpose it is that God has, has planned for those who believe in him, it will truly, truly, truly make you humble you and make you fall on your face before him because it is far greater than anything you have ever learned in any church that you might have attended for 50 years. Now let's turn back one uh, verse before Genesis 127 to Genesis 126 and take a look at what it tells us. 
And God said, let us make man in our image, comma, after our likeness. So there we have again those two words, image and likeness. So again, like, you know, we think that, you know, this word image applies to Adam, but it does not. This word image applies to Jesus Christ. And then it, the word likeness applies to Adam. And uh, now I'm going to turn to Genesis chapter 5. This is the first time these words image and likeness are used is in Genesis 126. And then, you know, Genesis 127. And then it is in Genesis chapter 5 that we again see these words being used. Let's look at Genesis chapter 5 verses 1 to 3 in the King James Version of the English Language Bible, which is the only version that I use and the only version that I believe to be the Word of God. Okay, in verse 1 it tells us this is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. So you can see here that God doesn't say that he made Adam in the image of God. And you know that the Bible does make a distinction between likeness and image is apparent because when you read on there, it says male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. And Adam lived in 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness and after his image. Now what we see here is that when it tells us begat a son in his own likeness and after his image. So it tells us that Seth, who was Adam's son, was both his image and his likeness. And what does that mean? Well, image means that he was inside, he was a man. So just like, you know, when a man has a child, that man is also mankind. That's what he's telling us, that Adam begot a son who, like Adam, was mankind or Adam kind. And then it tells us he was in his own likeness, and this likeness, of course, is a reference to the body, that it is in the body. The son was not identical to Adam, but he was just like him with, you know, two legs, two arms, two eyes, etc. So in the case of man's offspring, we are told that he was both in body like the father and in image, in character, and in the inside, he was identical to the father. Okay. And in, the, or at least he had the ability that he was born with, that he could acquire the character of the father. So what I'm trying to get at here is that uh, in the case of man and his children, they are also the same kind in their inner being. Like, you know, that their soul, their mind, their spirit, etc., develops like that of the parent. So they are copies of that parent on their inner being. And they are also like their parents in their bodies, okay, because they have the same bodies. They may not look identical, but they are similar. That's why it is said about Adam and Seth that he begat a son in his own likeness and after his image. In the case of man and Adam, God and Adam, however, in verse 5, when, in Genesis 5, verse 1, it, all it says is that Adam was made in the likeness of God. In the likeness of God made he him, which means that he could be like God in the inside, in his character, in his mind, in his thoughts, etc. But he wouldn't be identical to him. He wouldn't be the same kind as him. He would only be similar to him, as we can also read in the book of James, where it tells us that God made man, or men are made in the similitude of God. They are not made in his image. Now I'm going to turn to, before I do actually, I was going to give some references to the word image and see how many times that word image is used for Jesus Christ and never for Adam, okay? And, uh, but before I do, I wanna make an interesting observation here that in verse two, we read, male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. This I already mentioned in my last uh, video that God called both Adam and Eve Adam or just men or mankind, okay? It was Adam that he named his wife Eve, okay? Eve is a proper name that was given by Adam. But secondly, it tells us in this where verse two, in the day when they were created. So it seems like Adam and Eve were created on the same day. They weren't like created years apart. Okay, now let's turn to and start seeing all the scriptures that first of all reference that Jesus Christ is the image of God and never that Adam is the image of God. And then lastly, I will define the word image. We will study the definition of the word image and then it will become clear that uh, why it tells us that Jesus is the image of God and not Adam or mankind in general. First of all, let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Let's read from verse 2 in, in regards to God speaking. Has in these last days, God in these last days has spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom he also, whom also he made the worlds. 
who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. It tells us this verse of scripture is very, very significant scripture in the Bible because of this one phrase in it, the express image of his person. This Bible, this verse of scripture tells us that Jesus is the image of God, but not only does it tell us what kind, what he is, it also tells us what he is an image of God, what part of God he is an image of him. It is, doesn't refer to anything to the body because, you know, folks, God did not have a body until Jesus was born. This, this whole purpose of creation is for God to form for himself a body. And when we think of the body of God, what we know in the Bible is the body of Christ. It is subdivided into many bodies, just like the human race, beginning with Adam and Eve, two people, or beginning actually with one person, Adam. It then multiplied into many, many different bodies. That is exactly how God has, that is a template for what God is actually doing in this time in his creation. He is replicating himself in bodily form, beginning with the body of Jesus, okay? But the image that Jesus bore was not a bodily because God didn't have a body before then. It was his person. And that is, these are the words we will look at, the meaning of the word image in this verse of scripture, and also the word, the meaning of the word person to understand what it is that we are being told that Jesus, how is Jesus and the image of God, okay? And how does that differ from Adam being the likeness of God? Now to gain even a better understanding of what God is doing, what was the purpose of creation, we can look at the multiplication of mankind. Like I said, it began with Adam, and since then it has multiplied in billions. So when man reproduces himself, okay, when man and woman have a baby, the baby is a reproduction of the man and the woman. But that reproduction is the body. So man and woman reproduce the body. The person that actually goes inside that body, God breathes into his nostril the the breath of life in that man or per woman or girl or boy becomes a living soul. So the soul comes from God. It is the father and mother that actually reproduce the body. Okay, so the reproduction in the case of human beings is the reproduction of the body. However, in the case of God at this time, something different is taking place, although the there is a similarity between the idea of reproduction. God is indeed reproducing himself. What he is at the present time reproducing is not the body. The body that we are going to dwell in actually has not yet been produced. It will be. So the body will be produced, not reproduced. What God is reproducing at this present time is his person inside of each believer. Okay, This is exactly what happened with Christ Jesus. God, the person, inhabited that body. That's what made Jesus God, okay? But the same process is now at work in each one of us that we are being transformed into the image or person of Christ, who in turn is the image or the person of God. See, the general consensus teaching of the mainstream church is and has been for some time now that Adam was the perfect image of God and a perfect person in the garden before he ate the fruit and so sinned and basically fell, as we understand, the fall of man. However, if that were the case, a scripture, for example, like we read in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. You know, why would there have been a need to make a new creature? Then he should have just gone back to being the old creature that Adam was, right? That's what should have been the goal, was to bring Adam back to where he used to be. But that is nothing like that is happening in the Bible. It is a transformation which is creating a completely new species of creature, which is not mankind, because in the Bible, in 1 Corinthians 15, we can read that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So if flesh and blood could be, have been perfect, then why did God not just take him back to where he used to be and continue, right? If that was the finished product right in the beginning, then all God needed to do was not to make him a new creature, but make him into the old creature that he was before he fell. And then he could have inherited God's kingdom okay, as flesh and blood. But we are told that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, that it belongs only to the new creatures in Christ. So these new creatures in Christ, they are not flesh and blood man like Adam was even before his fall. Okay, 
And again, in 1 Corinthians, in chapter 15, we can read that the first man was of the earth. He was earthy. He was a natural man. He was not a spiritual man. And this is the understanding that I am beginning to teach here is that to be spiritual, a person needs a conscience, which comes from the knowledge of good and evil. So therefore, before Adam and Eve had the knowledge of good and evil, there was it was absolutely impossible for them to be spiritual. All they could be was natural people. They could understand the natural world and just in, around them, but they had no understanding whatsoever of the spiritual nature of God. And that nature of God, in order to teach them that, he had to teach them what was his opposite, which is what the purpose of the devil and of evil being in that garden and the knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if you think of that name of that tree, the tree of the knowledge was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was not the tree of the knowledge of good or evil. If the knowledge of good could come without the knowledge of evil, evil would never have existed. If that name could have been good or evil, it would mean that one can acquire the knowledge of good without the knowledge of evil. But that is not the name of the tree. The name of the tree was the knowledge of good and evil. This is why Satan, evil, came into existence to be the opposite of God, which is the word, very meaning of the word Satan. He is the opposer, the opposite, so that we could learn what good means by understanding evil. Okay, so these things had to happen before that new creature in Christ, who is spiritual, could come into existence. Okay, and it is this creature in Christ that is being transformed into the image of God. Okay, so Adam was only made in the likeness of God, but it is through this process where Christ Jesus, God himself, would come in the flesh and he would shed his blood. And it is the shedding of that blood, which is pure life, that it would become possible then to purge the conscience, the evil conscience of man, and transform it into the good conscience of God so, that God, so that man would then become that new creature, the new species, which is God kind, which is a God being, and no longer mankind or a corrupt being. Okay, he is a pure being like God is. That is what is meant by being formed or shaped or transformed into the image of God. Now let's take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. It says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So who are we being told here is the image of God? It is, of course, Christ Jesus and not Adam. And again, we read in uh, the book of Colossians, in chapter 1, verse 15, or beginning in 14, it says, In whom, meaning in Christ Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Verse 16, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. So it tells you all these devils, principalities, thrones, you know, in, in Ephesians, we can read about the principalities and powers, right? These are the evil creatures. They too, not just the evil principalities can also be good. The angels have principalities as well. But still, like in regards to the good or the evil, it doesn't matter. They were all created by God and for him, for him. So evil was created for him. So people that say, you know, evil, oh, no, 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 no. Evil doesn't really, you know, just, you know, they, they kind of don't answer the question how and why it came into existence if God created all things. But like I told you, that evil was necessary, otherwise it wouldn't exist, because evil is used in the transformation or in the reprogramming of our conscience. It's necessary. So in verse 15, we read, who is the invis image of the invisible God? Who is the image? Who? Christ Jesus is the image of the invisible God, not Adam. And then again, you can look at here, the firstborn of every creature. Like I told you right in Revelation, it's out that Jesus is the beginning of the creation of God. Here it tells us he is the firstborn of every creature. Now let's go back to Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 and take a look at it. And now the scripture will make sense to you that Jesus being the firstborn when it tells us in the image of God. So God made man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. That him is Jesus Christ because he is the firstborn. And male and female created he them which is Adam and Eve. So in the natural the process is reversed where man and woman Adam and Eve come first. Okay male and female come first. And then comes the spiritual. 
But in the spiritual, the process begins with Christ Jesus, the beginning of God's creation, the firstborn of every creature, basically the very purpose of which everything was created, was created with this in mind, that God himself would take form, would reproduce himself in bodily form. That was the purpose. So in the spirit, Jesus comes first. In the natural, Adam comes first. So when Jesus comes first in the spirit, then he is the one in the image of God created he him, that him is Christ Jesus, not Adam. Now let's turn back to Genesis chapter 5, verse 1 again. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God, made he him. The word likeness here again now, so we can get a little better understanding. What we have been taught here is that man was created with the faculty of eventually being transformed into the image of God through the knowledge of God, which would be brought to him through the knowledge of good and evil. Then that transformation process would be completed. And once it was, then he would be in his character, in his inner person, he would be identical to God. Okay, this work was first finished in Christ Jesus when he said on the cross, it is finished. That's what it meant, that the process was now finished, that everything that was required to now begin transforming man, Adam and his children into the very image of God could become possible because what was required was the ink, the only ink that could write God's conscience onto the man's, onto the conscience of man. And that ink is the pure blood which is life. In the Bible, we are told that life is in the blood. So when the Christ, when Christ's blood was shed, what was shed was pure life. And it is that life, that blood, when applied to the conscience of man. As we read in Hebrews 9, 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ purge your conscience? So where does this blood need to be applied? It needs to be applied. Uh, you hear all kinds of nonsense, you know, in Pentecostal circles. Oh, I plead the blood of Christ, plead the blood of Christ and all that kind of stuff. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. What the Bible teaches is that that blood is applied to our conscience. Life is applied to death. Good is applied to evil. Light is applied to darkness. Did it not say, say that God commanded the light to shine out of darkness? Do you think all those things, the darkness that covered the earth in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, all these things were just accidental? No, it is all a process that began a long time ago, many ages before Adam. As I have taught in many of my videos, you can go back and listen to the history videos and understand the history of creation goes a long, long, long ways back before Adam. That process began then, and that process was finished on the cross when Christ said it is finished. And that's what is meant by this verse in Genesis 5.1, that in the likeness of God made he him, that because Adam had the faculties, he had the soul, and he acquired the spirit, the conscience, which could eventually be transformed into the very soul, the very mind of Christ, and the very heart, the spirit of God. That's what would make him one who was a creature created in the image of God. See, if Adam was a perfect being right from the beginning and all God needed was this man who was perfect, then God could have restored him and Adam would have been called the firstborn, right? Because Adam came before Jesus in the natural, but he did. He's not called the firstborn because the firstborn, the person, the first person who in bodily form is fully God is Christ Jesus. The first person who lives in a body and yet is God and not man he is the son of man because he has the body of man. But the person that dwells in him is God. Therefore, he is the son of God. Okay? So that first person, the firstborn, the beginning of the creation of God is Christ Jesus. He is the first one that bore the image of Christ, image of God in Genesis 1.27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created he him, meaning Christ Jesus. And male and female created he them, from whom this process in the process of time would be completed and then would begin. Then it would become possible for God to have this race of new creatures in Christ who bear his image. Now we're going to move on to the definition of image. Well, before we before I uh, go into the definition of the word image, let's look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass, 
the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image. All right, folks, once again, I stress that this is a process that began in the Garden of Eden, okay? And it involved evil. It involved the knowledge of good and evil. It involved death coming into this world. It involved, you know, Adam and Eve eating of that fruit to serve the purposes of God. Because what God was going to do was to first create a creature in his likeness, meaning that he would have the faculties of soul and spirit that would be able to comprehend, be able to be identical to his own. This is why we have the mind of Christ, because the mind of Christ means that you have the mind of God in you, all right? And that is the soul of God, those who believe. And the spirit or the conscience of God comes to us as our evil conscience is purged. But first, the conscience that man acquired, the first consciousness or knowledge that man acquired, it was necessary that that be evil. That is the only way this transformation, this changing into the image could take place. That image could not be just imprinted on us. And remember that word imprint, because we're going to go into the definition of image, and that is an important word. That image of God could not be imprinted on a blank slate like Adam and Eve were in the garden. They first had to have a slate that was that was corrupted, okay? It is like there had to be a virus that had to be introduced into their system like it is introduced into a computer. And then a software program would be written that would come and overwrite that virus so that never again could that infection, that evil that had infected them would be able to overpower them, okay? That is the only way a God child can be created is one, a son of God who is not, who cannot be tempted with evil like God is. So in order to bring us to that place, we first had to go through that passage of evil. We had to go through that temptation and fall, and eventually God would make the way, and he would then begin the process of shaping us, transforming us, overwriting that evil in us with his life, with his good, with his blood, and that would bring us to a place eventually where never again will evil ever be able to overpower us. It is only such creatures that are the offspring of God, that are the begotten sons of God, that are the heirs of God, to whom God will give his kingdom with pleasure because he knows they will never turn to evil. But we had to be transformed into that, and that had to happen by this process which has happened. Okay, God's planning is without flaw. Nothing has happened. Not a blade of grass moves from here to there without it serving the purposes of God. And people who do not understand the story of the knowledge of good and evil and the story of the Garden of Eden, or they, you know, they just they, they, they just uh, diminish it by saying it was just a test of obedience, they will never be able to understand their God. As I've said, you know, many times through this presentation and through this series, I will repeat it again and again, that the whole purpose of creation, the ultimate purpose of creation, let's say, is for God to reproduce himself. Now we can learn a lot about reproduction from human reproduction. In the case of man, what is reproduced first is the body, okay? The child is born, he is basically a body and his mind and his spirit is a blank slate, okay? The Bible talks a lot about children before they reach the age where they understand good and evil. All right, so, and then begins the process of writing their minds, which is filled as knowledge is filled into their minds. That is how they, are written in their minds or in their souls. And of course, as they learn good and evil, then their spirit is being written, their conscience is being written. So in the case of man, the body comes first, then comes the soul and the spirit, or the, or the, or the mind and the conscience. In the case of God's reproduction, the process is reversed, okay? While we are in this body, which is a mortal body, which is a corrupt body, which is going to die, what is happening is God is working in us. And as I just read to you from 2 Corinthians, that we are being changed into the image of Christ day by day as we die daily, as we walk our, pick up our cross and, uh, you know, take up our cross and follow him daily. We behold him as in a mirror, which is, of course, the word of God as we study and we pray and we fast. That these things, God works in us through his spirit and he transforms us. What he's transforming us is our mind. All of you believers who have been believers for a while, has your mind changed since you first came to believe? You know, if you remember back, you know, when you used to be basically in the world, has your thought process changed since then? 
Has your heart and your understanding of good and evil changed since then? That is a transformation that is taking place. So in this God's reproduction, he is first of all reproducing in us his mind, which is called the mind of Christ, and his heart, which is our conscience, that he is writing our evil conscience with his own good conscience. That is what is happening. So the inner person, the real person, the person that is me inside here is being changed from mankind to God kind. Okay. And eventually, when I will leave this body one day, and at the return of Christ, this process will be completed when I will be given my new body. So as I said, in human reproduction, it begins with the body, and then the mind and the spirit are shaped. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the case of God, it is the mind and the spirit, the soul and the spirit, the, 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 the knowledge or, or, or what you consider to be your consciousness and your conscience, they are transformed first, and then we will be given the body. And only those in whom this transformation has taken place while they're yet alive in this body will be given that new body, which is incorruptible, and then the process will be complete. Then God will be all in all, that in those bodies, the person that will be existing is not going to be mankind or Adam kind or flesh and blood man, no sir, or anything that is in any way, shape or form evil. In that, the person will be a God being. He will be a God person. He will be a, a species of God, not of man or of an angel of any other creature. And that is what is going to make them God offspring. And I will tell you later as to why it is necessary that this must happen. Now let us look at the meaning of the word image as used in Hebrews 1.3, that Jesus Christ is the express image of God's person. Okay. Now we got to keep in mind that many of the doctrines and many of the teachings in the Old Testament, their full meaning was not understand, understood until the work of Christ had been completed and it was explained to us in the New Testament. Okay. One of these words is the word image. The full meaning of what was meant by this word when God said, in the image of God created he him, it came to be understood in this letter that was written by Paul the Apostle to the Hebrews. This word image in the Greek language is the word character. This is exactly where we get the word character in the English language, which is a transliteration of this Greek word. And what the meaning of this word is, if you want to look it up in the Strong's Dictionary, it is G5481. It, is, it says the instrument used for engraving or carving, remember when I told you about imprinting something, and the idea of writing, the idea of encoding, the idea of software, the idea of, uh, you know, uh, something being written, our hearts and our minds are both written, written with some knowledge. In the case of the mind, it is the knowledge of, you know, science and the natural world and all these other things, like, you know, the trees, the plants, the waters, and you name it. But in the case of the heart, which is the conscience, the knowledge that is written is the knowledge of good and evil. In this present time, our heart is written with both the knowledge of good and evil. We both do evil and we suffer evil. And some of us, you know, we do good and good is done to us. So we have both. The ultimate goal is, of course, for God to take away all that evil and leave in there only the good. So that is what makes us godlike. Not just godlike, it makes us literally God in our person, okay? And that is what is meant by that Hebrews 1, 3, that he is the express image of his person, meaning the express image of God's person. So this character, this character formation is done like in the old days, uh, an engraver, when he was going to engrave something, you know, on a brick or a stone or something, they would take a chisel and they would shape the characters. This is where we get the word characters as far as our language, the letters of our language is concerned, we call them characters. It comes from that word that, you know, it was, it was done with an engraving tool. So what God is doing in this time, he is engraving his character onto our hearts and minds. More importantly, the heart, which is our seat of our conscience, okay, which is our spirit. That has to be not just like God, it has to be identical to God. Anybody that is the heir of God has to be identical in conscience to God. Jesus said, this is a very you know, interesting scripture. I mean, most people don't really understand what it means. He was talking to the young man and he said, you know, this, why do you call somebody called him good master? 
And he said, why callest thou me good? There is none good save one that is God. And what he meant by that is that there is only one in all creation that is absolutely good, meaning that he is incapable of doing or ever being evil, and that person is God. Okay, And that is what is required by God to do to us, is to make us into that very same persons that we too will become incapable of evil and become absolutely good as he is. And believe you me, that if you think you can make it into God's kingdom being relatively good, having a, even a little bit of evil in you and mostly good, it won't happen because the word of God tells us that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Even one little grain of evil left in us will eventually turn our heart to darkness and evil as it happened to the angels, as it happened to man. And that is the reason why angels are not the heirs of God and neither is flesh and blood man. Therefore, this new creature was necessary who had to be shaped and transformed and engraved and molded and imprinted and written upon so that he could become not just God-like, he could become literally God in his person. When I say, you know, we are going to be made God, or we are, that is the process that is happening in us, I know a lot of people, you know, they start thinking, oh man, here is Lucifer and all that. That is not what I am trying to say here. That I'm not saying that, you know, you are suddenly going to become God the Father or something, or even the Son of God, or the first begotten Son, or the only begotten Son, or the firstborn Son, or Jesus Christ. No, you're not. But in, his, in, in your character, you have to be identical to him. What position you will be given is entirely up to God. It is like in a family. Let's consider Adam's family. Adam alone is the father of all human beings that followed. Okay, So all the human beings that followed, like in the case of Seth, we are told that he begot a son in his own likeness and after his own image. That means that that son, though he too, like the father, is a man, their positions are not interchangeable. The son can never become the father, and the father will always remain as the progenitor where the son will always be the progeny. So their positions are set. And that is how it is in God's kingdom and in his family. All of us are going to hold different positions, okay? But on our inside, in our character, as this word tells us here, we have to be identical to him, which is that we have to be perfectly and absolutely incapable of evil. We have to be absolutely good, like God. Otherwise, we're not gonna make it into his kingdom, okay? That's what I mean that we are going to be God kind, we are going to be a God species, we are no longer, we cannot make it there as human beings or as angel kind or as any other kind except as God kind. Now keep it, let's keep on looking at this definition. The instrument used for engraving or carving, the mark stamped upon that instrument or wrought out on it. A mark or figure burnt in or stamped on an impression. But this is the 2B, definition 2B on your screen. The exact expression, the image of any person or thing, marked like likeness. And look at this one here, precise reproduction in every respect that is facsimile. And that is what God requires and that is what God is doing. He is reproducing his consciousness, but more importantly, he is reproducing his conscience in us. And that's the good news, my friends, okay? This had to happen like this, and I'll tell you why. Because the only one that God wants to have, why do we have families? Because we want to have relationships, right? Adam made, God made Adam a wife so they could have a relationship. They had children so they could have a relationship with their children and so on and so forth. That is the whole purpose of families. We can have a relationship, which means we can have somebody that we can relate to and they in turn can relate to us. How do people relate? Okay, we do it on every level. We do it mentally, we do it spiritually, and we even do it physically, okay? So God, when he set about to reproduce himself, he wanted to have a family. And what kind of family is suitable for God? Does it not have to be God kind? Do not God's family have to be God's species? They have to be God's children? They can't be angels because angels are not the same kind as God. They can't be men because men are not the same kind as God, okay? The only one that can fully relate to God is God. The only one that can love God fully is God. So essentially, God had to reproduce more of himself. 
It's as simple as that. But the process is not so simple. The process is rather complex because the reproduction part, in the case of man, you know, we are happy just reproducing your body and then whatever kind of person will eventually form in it, you know, nobody gives it any thought. But in the case of God, what was important was the character, the image that would be imprinted on the inside of the, on the person that would live inside the body. So God did not begin this process of creating his children in bodily form first. Okay, the body of his children that are going to be his heirs is going to come later. He began by this creature called man, who was lower even than the angels, but he made him in his own likeness. That is, means he gave him the faculty to be able to have his consciousness and to have his conscience. And then he slowly worked in it. This is the, this is the wonder of God that he's working in me, he's working in you, he's working in, you know, person in Africa somewhere, and another person sitting in China and in India and in Germany and France, you know, England, who knows, Australia, Singapore, all over the world, in Brazil, you name it. He's working in individuals, you know, he's working one here, one there, carefully engraving his own character onto their minds and to their hearts. That's what's happening. That's why we are here in this life. And this is the miracle and the wonder of God that in a few short years, like, you know, I'm not quite 60 years old yet. And I know the miracle that God has done in my life, how he has transformed me. Even while I was literally sleeping, you know, and there's a scripture in Luke, I believe somewhere that, you know, or in, in Mark or Matthew, that, you know, that the, so, that, that, uh, that the farmer, he merely throws the seed into the ground and then the corn starts to grow. The plant comes up, the ear begins to form and the corn begins to form inside it. The farmer doesn't know how. All he did was to plant the seed. But it is God who does it. And that's exactly what happens to us. We come to believe in him. And then he begins to work in us. And he begins to transform us. He does this miracle inside of us. And that day will come when our redemption will be completed. And my friends, you will not be able to be evil. And that is the full measure of love. Even a little bit of evil inside of us, it stifles love. And that is how we will be able to fully love God as he loves us. We'll be able to fully understand him as he understands us. We'll be able to fully relate to him as he relates to us. So do you understand the purpose of how great the purpose is for which God created us? God is love. And love is a two-way thing. It's a give and take. God fully knows how to give love. But he had to teach his children how to give love back. And that comes from having a pure conscience like his. Otherwise, you can never love God. Man can, you know, in our present state, we can love God only in, in a very limited way. We have no idea of the full extent of his love, how much he loves us. That will happen when we are, when our, and our redemption is complete, when we are housed in our new incorruptible bodies then you will understand the full measure of the love with which we will love him and the purpose for which God began this creation and suffered so much through so many ages will all be forgotten. The sufferings of this present age and the ages that have gone by will even be forgotten by God and it'll be all worth it. But the work is not small, my friends. God is not interested in leaving you as mankind or, you know, just lifting you up to the status of angels. He wants to bring you up right up to his own level so that you can sit on his throne. Do you think he's going to share his throne with anybody that's less, lesser than him? Is of a different kind than he is? Like, does a man share his throne with a monkey? Of course he doesn't. He shares it with his son who also is a man like him. That is how God is. He has created us to bear his image, meaning to have his character to be transformed on the inside. And this is what the Apostle Paul was striving for. I love that man, you know, how, how he, he, he gave himself, not just 100%, he gave himself like a billion percent to God, where he said his desire was that he could literally be the, see this transformation in him finish while he was yet in this body. That's how just badly he wanted it for to be that image of God in him, to be finished, that writing, that God is writing on us to be completed. Okay, so that is what the word image means. It means character. It means the inner person. It is that is what is being copied on us here. God, God wrote the encoding 
of who he is. This is literally what happened in Jesus Christ. That God created the template. He created the, the, the Jesus is called the archetype. It is like, you know, when you're going to do, uh, in the old days when they're going to print books, they would make the die cast, you know, and then they would stamp each sheet with that. And that is what God has done. He has created the template that is God and that he is stamping it on our hearts one at a time. Even as the world is going about his merry way, you know, sliding straight down to hell, God is busy at work. Do you think he's not? God is not working in this time and corporately. He's not working on a national level. He's not working on a, on a group level. He's working on an individual level in each one of us. All right. So anyways, now I would like to end this year today as to this teaching and image. This again, I might add, this is only the beginning. I think I've only touched the surface. This goes so much deeper. And one of the things in education, if those people who follow what goes on in our world, one of the things that has happened since the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, or 1960s is that education was transformed where kids were made actually dumber. They, they, they were not taught like things like real language and grammar and you know higher logic thinking processes. They were just taught how to, you know, to regurgitate a few little things and then they said, here's your diploma, go away. All right. So they were dumbed down. There's a book by Charlotte Isabeth called The Dumbing of America or something like that. And there are other people who have written about how the education process would transform. But the same thing has happened in the church as well. And that church has been even longer at it for the last 1900 years or so, where they have been dumbing down the message that is in the Bible, the teachings of the Bible, the real truth of the Bible. It has been dumbed down so that people who sit in church, they have no idea of who God is. Isn't that a tragedy? It really is. But my God, he is amazing. He really is. And I literally can see that, you know, when I look hold myself in the mirror, I'm not looking at the face of this body, which is corrupting and dying. What I see is the man that I'm on the inside and how God has worked and is working to change me daily. It is a real thing. It is not theoretical. It is 100% real. So I hope that you have been blessed by this teaching. I hope that you will open your Bibles. I hope you will study the meanings of these words. And I hope you will begin to comprehend the great purpose which God has purposed for you. And the great purpose is this, that in the end, there will be no more you. You and I, we are the evil things that God has begun with. And he is going to shape us and transform us so that in the end, only thing that will be left inside will be God. And that man that I used to be, like, the, like John the Baptist said, you know, I must diminish, but he must increase. It won't be just a little bit left in there. There'll be nothing left of a man. Thank God for that. All right. God bless you all. Thank you for listening. This is Paul Sandhu. It all happened many years ago in a time we know today. A stranger came into our world with many songs to play. His words were wise and full of love. The stories he did share He promised us a special gift If we would meet him there When John the baptizer came Preaching through the land He cried to all generations The reign of God's at hand I baptize you in water of the words he claimed to all but he who comes he brings a spirit to every man that hears his call amen amen god sent his son for man amen amen we offer up to god again amen
Son for man, amen. 